too much on this, but uh, I graduated from AIPAC in 93. Please don't do the math, I'm 40 years old, you just turned 40 this year, so mm -hmm. I know there are some of you that are feeling really old now, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, joined the United States Marine Corps, came out of the Marine Corps, uh, majored in history with my minor in English literature. I've been teaching middle school now, uh, middle school social studies for 15 years. So basically, the new book is entitled An Absence of Faith. Uh, for those of you that have read it, some of the imagery that you'll see here will make a lot of sense. For those of you that haven't read it and will read it, the imagery will definitely go off. Now I understand why I have that there. Uh, so a young woman is viciously murdered in Queens. The killer has left every indication that this will be his first in a long reign of terror. Uh, Detective Kate Man is, hunt is hunting the elusive butcher while desperately trying to decipher his message. And then we have following the trail of blood, Kate will be pushed to her limits as she's drawn into an age-old battle that challenges what it means to have faith in God and in man. So the book really is uh, something that deals with our relationship with religion and our relationship with each other. So it's very much a character-driven book. So when you guys said, you know, like, we started with the characters. Uh, one of the things that I did not realize when I started to write was that there really are plot-driven writers and, and character-driven writers. And the more I reflect back on the, the books that I've always fallen in love with as, as a reader, I realize that they're character books. Books that the character comes first and, and the character drives the plot. And so as I've started to write, I've realized that I don't control the plot. I've realized that once you flesh out the characters well enough, they completely drive the bus which will really aggravate you as a writer because you have this plot in mind and then suddenly these characters take over and, and it really ticks you off when they take your plot someplace you didn't want it to go. But nevertheless, you have to kind of let them. So I figured tonight that uh, I, I would really take a look at sort of the anatomy of the villain. Uh, I'm a big believer in the fact that the villain in a book has to be really, really great because if the villain is great, then so too the hero is great. And if the hero's that, you know, mediocre is probably because the villain is mediocre. So uh, I like to create characters with what I refer to as the Dr. Frankenstein method. So pretty much a villain like, a villain is a character like any other, and the way I create that villain is to use what I already know. So the whole simple vantage point of writing is write what you know, right? And, and that's sage advice for anybody who wants to write. So where I start, is literally, like, this is something that uh, my wife and I made up for her classroom, for her students. How to create a character. So you've got to start simple. Start with a name, and then start with things like what drives your character. For me, I always think of a villain as, well, what's going to drive them? And where we find the drive for our villain is usually always in things that make us angry, or things that make us upset, and then take that to the most logical and ridiculous outcome. So you have, you know, let's say somebody who has road rage. The most logical and ridiculous outcome for somebody with road rage is they're going to get out of the car and they're going to murder somebody, right? If you have somebody who, you know, is obsessed with food, how far is, can that obsession go? So I, I like to kind of take a character and say, okay, take them to the most sort of kind of ridiculous extreme and find a way to write that. Way. So, as I said, start simple, really think about what drives your character, and suddenly you have kind of created this Frankenstein's monster. And exactly like Dr. Frankenstein, who creates this monster and thinks he can control him, he realizes that he cannot control him, that the monster has a mind of its own. So if you've created a good character, you're going to realize that this character suddenly has a mind of its own, and it's going to do everything it wants, and you've lost control of it. So that's why I refer to this kind of character thing as a, a Frankenstein monster. Every character really is a Frankenstein monster to a, a certain extent. As I said, writing what you know, when I first started writing An Absence of Faith, I wrote it actually uh, as a graphic novel. And I wrote it as a graphic novel because I was a huge comic book geek as, geek as a kid, you know, 20,000 comic books sit in the basement. Uh, and that was really kind of the, uh, where I blossomed as a reader. And then, of course, reading comic books, you turn around and say, oh, you know, a comic book mentioned the mythological character. So you would read a story about mythological characters, and, and so on and so forth, 
until you wound up reading all of these novels that comic book writers would reference. So that's how kind of I, I started to really explore beyond just comic books and got into you know, prose novels and things like that. So with an absence of faith, uh, I actually uh, had a, a, a friend who start to draw it, and, and things sort of fell through, and, and uh, some family members said to me, well, you know, if this is good, you should really flesh it out into a novel. And I had a hard time doing that because I didn't see it as a novel. I saw it in a very visual and visceral way. So when I started trying to flesh out the novel, uh, I, I really learned some valuable lessons from writing the outhouse that I wanted to attack the novel in a very different way. So I, I chose a, a very different form of narration for the novel and, and wanted to do some different things with my characters. Basically, the way I approach things is I really have the central characters in my mind at first, and then I say to myself, okay, you know, where do I see the, the chapter beats, the various different events throughout the course of the chapter, and I lay those out. Then as I write and sort of flesh out the characters, that's pretty much when they start making their own choices, and I have to kind of trust them. I, I, I often tell people about when I was writing The Outhouse, it was interesting because there was a moment where I had written a character, and there's a point in the book where a character has to die. And I really did not want to say goodbye to that character. I genuinely did not. Uh, and I didn't want to kill the character. But it had to happen. It had to. And what, what's interesting is, is that, and I'm, I'm going to blow my wife up a little bit here for a minute. What's interesting is, is that when I wrote the chapter and I had her read it and she started to cry, I was like, all right, I did it well. And then as she edited the chapter probably a dozen times and cried every single time, even though she knew it was coming, that's when I kind of knew, like, all right, I got that. I, I did a good job on that one. And I was proud of that, except I didn't want to kill the character. Um, but as I said, you lose control of the plot at some point. And it's a good thing for the reader, I guess. Probably mm -hmm. not the right one. So, the first character that I'd like to discuss in an absence of faith is the, the villain. This is Victor. Uh, Victor is born from my late night talks with my brother. I spent a long childhood where my brother and I uh, are classic siblings, beating the crud out of each other, with me usually the loser and him usually the winner. And then, of course, the classic siblings so, of, you know, nobody else could mess with me, only him. And, and then the, as we got older, he would often come to me and he would pose some really, really deep religious, moral, ethical, and, and philosophical questions to one another. And we would talk about those. And so the late night talks with my brother are really what is this villain is born from those late night talks. Again, that idea of write what you know. I also have uh, a great love and respect for my parents, particularly my mother. I owe her a great deal of fealty. And I really wanted to write characters in a book where they did have very differing relationships with their mother, and how that relationship with their mother would have defined who they became. Um, and, and then, again, that kind of relationship with God that was so central to so many of the talks that I had with my, my brother. The lead character in the book is a, a detective named Kate Manning. I like to use Kate in the book as kind of our everyman. Kate is the person who I think we get to see all of these events through her eyes in many respects. So we get to see her relationship with other human beings, and as a detective and with uh, relatives who are police officers and, and uh, investigators, I get to see kind of how they can become quite jaded about human behavior and human beings. So I really wanted to kind of inject Kate with some of that jaded attitude, but also that sense of hopefulness that you know maybe, maybe, maybe I'm seeing the world wrong, and maybe just maybe we really wanted to have her as the, the everyman, that we could look through, at the world through her eyes. Um, again, Kate, like every other character in the book, has uh, mommy issues to some extent uh, as far as their, her relationship with them. The character Gregory in the book is uh, Victor's brother, and he is the counterweight. Again, born from my late night talks with my brother, these two sort of adversarial positions. Um, Gregory takes sort of the opposite, not sort of, the opposite opinion of Victor, and the book, and much of the conflict in the book arises as these two 
guys are effectively trying to prove each other wrong. And neither of them seem altogether too concerned about the collateral damage that occurs as the two of them are competing to prove that you know, I, I'm right and you're wrong. So within this argument that these two guys have, we have the ability to look and say, okay, the boundaries of good and evil, and, and which one is right? Somebody that read the book once said to me, he said, he said I, I don't like you. And I said, well, why? He said, because there were points in the book where I was agreeing with the villain. And I didn't like that. And I was like, but that's good. He said, no, I didn't like that feeling. That feeling of as this villain is sort of kind of laying out his, his philosophy and logic, he could buy into some of it. And, and as much as he said he didn't like me, I realized that he really enjoyed the book, and, and I got an intent. Um, and I'm hopeful that somebody that would read An Absence of Faith uh, would really sort of chew on the book long after, really kind of look and say, okay, what would I have done? If I could get in the shoes of some of those characters, would I have done something different? Another character in the book is Mike. Uh, Mike is very much our hero character. I tried to write a character that I felt that any female that read the book would fall in love with. Uh, I, I didn't want him to be uh, a, the sort of ridiculousness of, of a guy like Christian Grey or something like that. I wanted him to be a, a very realistic, down-to-earth, lovable sort of guy that you would want in your life. Uh, and it's funny because one of the females that read the book said, she goes, I'll take two. Uh, and again, so when I get those sort of character reactions it, it's affirming for me to let me know, all right, I achieved the objective that I wanted. I created a character in the way that I, I was hopeful for. Um, the setting in the outhouse and the setting in an absence of faith is very different. So the setting in the outhouse is very, very important and central to the story. So for those of you that, that have read the outhouse, it is a depression era novel. Um, and, and it is disturbing in some places. It's, got some nice twists going to it, and the setting is so important to what's happening to the characters. The setting in an outhouse is very much uh, the driving force behind what is happening to these characters and why it's happening to them. And it's forcing to them to make choices that they might not ever have made. Um, I'll, I'll use a quote from my dad when, he was a, when I was younger, he said, you know, uh, all, everybody is a facade, and it only takes a moment for them to show their true colors. And you just have to be there at the right moment. And with the outhouse, I, I try to put characters in a moment that ask them, well, what are you willing to risk and what are you willing to do in order to achieve what you want? And unfortunately, there, there are, are characters that make the wrong choices. The setting in an absence of faith is very different. It's Queens, New York. It is not central necessarily to the story. So when I was writing it, I had to make a decision as to whether or not I spent a lot of time establishing Queens as a character in the book or not. I made a conscious decision in this one to not make Queens really the character in the book. Because what I thought of was is that I wanted you to be able to read it, and if you were in a city, you could just substitute city name for so I really didn't focus on the setting so much in, in An Absence of Faith. It, it's there, it's present, um, but it is not something that uh, is really central. What is central is an event that occurs in the book at the Dutchess County Fair. So I love the Dutchess County Fair, uh, and I really wanted to inject the Dutchess County Fair into the book. Um, I felt that because the characters were in New York City, it worked uh, to get them out of the city, get, get them uh, going to a place that was very uh, familiar to me and, and a happy place. So in a, in a book that is relatively dark and, and doesn't have a lot of happy moments, uh, I wanted to inject a few happy moments and, and the Dutchess County Fair seemed like the, the, the right place to go. Um, <clears throat> the way I try uh, to the best of my ability to write is short chapters. Short chapters are what I find the modern reader likes. Uh, I have seen way too many readers pick up a book and they look at the next chapter and they count the number and that's how they're going to decide whether or not they're going to read the next chapter or not. So I feel like if I keep the chapter short and at the end of that chapter give you something enticing to keep reading, you'll keep reading. Because you can always go, oh, check next chapter, there's only six or seven pages. I can go through that. 
oh, the next chapter is only nine. I can go through that. So really try and keep the chapter short and really try and keep the last moment in a chapter making you say, no, I don't think I can go to bed yet. Um, so little things like that's when I hear the scream, and smile menacingly as the screen door creaked open, open always room for more and more. So it's just two quick quotes from the outhouse that hopefully made somebody go, yeah, I'm not ready to go to bed yet. Um, coming up next for me uh, is actually a young adult novel. I've been asked by a number of people to try my hand at a young adult novel, so I'm going to give that a shot. My favorite book as a child was The Count of Monte Cristo. And what I see today is, is that The Count of Monte Cristo is about a 1,300-page novel, give or take, if it's unabridged. And most kids find that utterly daunting, and they won't go near it. But they are missing probably one of the greatest novels in history. A lot of kids know Dumas as the writer of The Three Musketeers, but they're missing out. So I'm actually in the process of working through The Count of Monte Collier Bach, which is very much a simple adaption of The Count of Monte Cristo. Anybody in here ever read The Count of Monte Cristo? All right. Well, what did you think? Did you like it? Yeah. Once, once you get into it. Right, once you, because it's so, it's right, it's so, such a needy novel. So, Edric Davies is the lead character in this. If you've read The Count of Monte Cristo, you'll see the initials mean something. He's going to start in a basketball game for the very first time because the lead, one of the lead players goes down. That player is Jason LeClaire. Again, if you've read The Count of Monte Cristo, that name will have meaning. And so what I do is I, I try and write a story that deals with an everyday high school of today. Uh, stylized, of course, with you know all the, the classic drama that you'll find in a high school. Um, a lot of hyperbole you know, as a result of that. And re then really inject all of this sort of Count of Monte Cristo characters. We end it with the betrayal. Edmond Dantes in uh, The Count of Monte Cristo is in love with a young lady. Uh, he becomes the captain of the ship. And there are some men who are quite jealous of what happens to him. So Edward Davies in the book becomes the star player, gets the girl, and those who are jealous of him have now been, are now bound and determined to make sure that he does not get all of the things that uh, about to, they're, they're going to ruin him. And the book it is wonderful because it takes Edmond Dantes he, through the prison, the Chateau de, uh, you know, tortures him for years. He gets out, uh, winds up a very, very wealthy man to the help of uh, someone that helps him escape prison, and he uses that money for his vengeance. So I'm going to keep the plot of, of the Count of Monte Cristo, but make it hopefully accessible to our young readers. Which leaves us here. Pepper away with questions if you've got them. Mm -hmm. Alfred, you don't need them. But thank you. <laughs> Go ahead. How long did it take you to write your first book? Do you have uh, Probably about two years. If I was able to sit down at a computer without any other things, without having kids and, and, and school and, and all of those other types of things, probably a lot faster, but honestly, writing afternoons, weekends, uh, I, I tell people all the time that there were times where I would get up very early in the morning before the kids and my wife would get out of bed on weekends, and I would start writing. And then without me really looking, breakfast would appear in front of me. And then there were some days where lunch would appear in front of me, and some really bad days where dinner would appear in front of me too. Um, so it, it took a while. And one of the things that I would say that I, I, I learned more than anything else is, is that the drafts were shocked. You think that you've done a really good job. You have and, 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 and really, like, you're, you're tapping away, and you're like, this is awesome. I love it. You know, it's flowing, and then you hand
hand it to somebody and they're like, whoa, what, I don't even know what the sentence says. I, I mean, so it took a while to go back through. Um, and, and the other thing that, that really got me was that there were certain points in the book that I, again, I learned a lot. There were certain points in the book where I did not want to allow the paragraph to do a thing. But I had to. And so I was fighting with myself. And I would walk away and I would write a different chapter and then go back to that and be like, no, not let me. And I'd go back and write another chapter. And then I'd go back and go, ah, and, and I would give it. And, and one of the best lessons I've, I've honestly learned is, is give it, give it. Let them do what they need to do. Don't stand in their way. And, and that's not an easy job. I don't know. One of the nice parts about this is because it's not my full-time job. I'm just sort of kind of doing it for the sake of doing it. Um, my full-time job has to come first. So, you know, depending on how you know busy school is and busy family is and things like that, uh, I, I write when I can. And there are times where I'm literally, I mean, just recently I'm vacuuming the house. I stopped vacuuming. The vacuum's on. I'm over at the computer. And, and my wife is like, what are you doing? So, yeah, I'll get back to it, I promise. I didn't, I didn't turn it off, you know. Uh, so, I would love to. I, I expect that I'll try and get out the Count of Montpelier High sometime in 2016. And, and I say 2016, hopefully early 2016, probably late 2016. Uh, and the, the sad thing is, is that you have this book that you're writing. And then I, I came home one day and I, I started typing an entirely different idea for a novel. And it's, I have to write some of that. It's, it's what I need to write right now. And so I'll, I'll write that until I, I, I don't need to write it anymore. Then come back to this, finish that off, and then go back and finish that. Um, thankfully, I pay somebody to do that now because the mice <laughs> killed my tractor. <laughs> so. Yes. Have you found that this is filling what you needed to fill? Because <laughs> I, coming from an artistic family, the same family, I felt I needed to do what I've done. Well, uh, an ex-girlfriend uh, read *An Absence of Faith*, and uh, she very much enjoyed it. And she said to me, she said. In your introduction, you said you started this shortly after your nanny died. And I realized, I went, oh, I'm about to get in trouble. <laughs> because she's right. She just was with me at the time and had no idea. And she always used to make fun of me. She'd be like, oh, you're sitting on the babysitter playing computer games. And it wasn't all well that I was doing. And so uh, a lot of the writing that I was doing was cathartic. Uh, it was a, a way in which for me to deal with things that I couldn't necessarily talk to people about, or they didn't necessarily see it the same way I did, or they didn't want to talk about it. And so it was a way for me to have a conversation with myself. And I think you probably understand that. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, I think it bothered her that I had kept it secret for so long, and, you know, that she had no idea that there was this entire part of me that she's totally clueless about. But anybody that knows me pretty much knows that that pretty much sums me up. There are huge parts of me that you don't even know about. Well, I thought it was all about comic books, though. Yeah, because it's like this deep comes out in our, in our artistic projects. Uh, and and Legos. Yes. And Legos. Yes. Yes. We were building Legos uh, for, for quite a while. Is your fourth book going to be on Legos? No, um, <laughs> actually, the, um, the, the, fourth book, uh, the fourth book I would really actually like to write. Uh, uh, but, a, 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 the fourth book really stems from the economic issues that the United States is facing. Um, if you look at the last anywhere from 30 to 40 years, you're starting to see the economy of the United States not necessarily working for everyone. And what happens when everything you were promised, you can't get? How do you deal with that? How do you change that? I, I, I often will talk to students and students who ask, you know, you know, why does a person become a terrorist? Because they feel that they have absolutely no hope of changing anything. They are so frustrated and so angry and they have no hope. And when a person has no hope, that's when they do really, really, really scary things. 
So I'd like to write a book that sort of takes the hopelessness that a lot of people are feeling in the United States today, and, and again, playing that out to its logical conclusion, which is not necessarily a great place to go, but it's a great conversation, I think, for people to have when they start Where thinking about, yeah, yeah. We, us as a nation and what we're doing or not doing, and, and starting to recognize that. So again, that, that's what I like to do. I like to try and take things that's okay. Where does it go to its logical conclusion? Yes. Do you have a title for that book yet? Uh, yeah. I was well, gonna say, I got a perfect one. Go post book. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's the forgotten man's war. Um, and, and I think that if we think about, even people that we know, how, how many of us know someone who seems to have been forgotten by society for whatever reason? And, and so, again, what happens when those disparate people lash out? They're going to lash out and do horrible things, but some of the best villains are ones that we go, I kind of understand why they're doing it. You know, if we can, if we can have a villain with a sort of soul, a sort of a sense of, oh, I get why they're doing it, and, and I could see myself doing it if I lost my mind a little bit. Those are most believable. So that's, that's the hope with that one. He said, that was a long way off. You've also said, too, the idea of every villain is the hero of their own story. I do. Which I think uh, is I'm, I'm a big important. believer that if you're writing a villain, that they have to be a hero of their own story. No, no one decides I'm the villain. Everyone decides I'm the hero, and everybody else is wrong. Mm -hmm. So I, I think uh, in both the outhouse as well as an absence of faith, the villain in both of those books definitely sees themselves as I'm right and everybody else is wrong. So, yeah. did you ever think of enlarging your bright eyes story? <laughs> uh, no, it's not good. Yeah, no, it's not necessarily. I, but think, I think that would be a good one. Actually, Fran uses that in her classroom. So. It's called The Path. Yep. And I have kids very upset when they realize what's actually happening in it. It's great. The, the story it's that great story. talking about is a short story that I had written when I was, coming, I was driving home from college one day, and there was a raccoon dead on the road. Now, you would think, oh, you know, the raccoon dead on the road. Well, he do. Um, but yet, that became the impetus for a story because it wasn't just the raccoon dead on the road. About two and a half feet away from that raccoon was another raccoon dead on the road. So I wrote a really ostensibly a short story, which is a science fiction story, but it wasn't. It was more Twilight Zone-esque, where you follow this family who is desperately trying to get their children to safety um, in the hopes that they can escape the invaders coming into their, their area. Um, these, these bright eyes. These and Goliaths, these, the, right? Right, these Goliaths <laughs> with bright eyes. And these Goliaths with bright eyes, obviously, are just cars. Um, but you follow this whole family, rooting for them, hoping for them, pulling for them, only to have the end of the story realize that they were just raccoons. Um, and so, you know, again, sort of that sense of really humanizing them and really tricking the reader into loving them and realizing that, uh, you know, they weren't really what I thought they were. Now, I've never really thinking about expanding. You could really embellish that. Further <laughs> <laughs> questions? Sure, Anyone in? Yes, why is it just Queens? Is your study? Um, I wanted it close enough to Manhattan so that I had a very, very, very large pool of people. I felt that if you didn't choose a city, then this guy would be too easy to find. Um, I also envisioned my villain as one part Christian Grey and three parts Hannibal Lecter. And so I felt that a guy with those sort of discerning tastes would need to be close enough to Manhattan um, to really deal with this. Uh, so I chose Queens because I really didn't want to set it in Manhattan. Manhattan is a little bit too thick. This allowed me the ability to kind of pull them out into the boroughs where I could have more of a, a, a typical family dynamic and family structure and brownstones and things like that, yet still allow me sort of the anonymity that a huge eight, eight million population city provided for somebody that wanted to do the things that this guy's going to do. I also, in the book, in the very early beginnings of the book, he is going to go to the potter's field, um, right, out on the island, he's going to get, get you know, there, and that, again, allowed me to play with some of the history of New York City. I like to inject a little history every so often into the books, um, being a history geek that I am. So it allowed me to inject some history as well. So that's really the, the, the ideas. Yeah. And then 
that's reference is always appreciated. Yes. Uh, I, you know, again, uh, one of the things that six times. My, my kids are funny because you know they'll always ask the question. They're uh, things you'll always find in a novel by me. You will always find a yellow lab. In honor of my dog Spanky. Spanky will appear in every book ever. He will have different names, but I promise you a love yellow lab will appear in every book. If I, I don't care what I'm writing, <laughs> it, a yellow lab will appear in every book. A, a, a general Marine Corps reference will probably appear in every book. It's just some way, shape, or form. Uh, hopefully it won't bore people. Uh, you know, maybe I'll write 12 books in my lifetime, I don't know, but uh, hopefully it won't bore. But there's little little things that are personal to me. Okay. So I actually did a tremendous amount of research, which was really, really uh, disconcerting. Six big publishing houses that really only take agents of work. Okay. So as soon as you send your work to an agent, one of the biggest complaints that I was researching was the agent is going to force you to tailor your novel towards existing novels so that you can say, here's my novel in the a la this writer, or a la this genre. One of the things that frustrates me as a reader is reading in a genre that I feel like I've already read this book. Now, I realize that that may sound somewhat arrogant, that I think, oh, these guys that are published, that, no, they're great writers. I think they're being forced to write novels every six months churning them out that are very formulaic. So especially with an absence of faith, I felt that if I'm gonna write a novel, I wanna write a novel that's scary, I wanna write a novel that's romantic, I wanna write a novel that is thought-provoking and kind of you know, leaves you thinking. What genre is that? It's a thriller, it's romantic, it's, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't want to force a novel into a particular genre. I, I, if I think back to the classic works, I, and again, I'll use The Count of Monte Cristo. I have heard people call The Count of Monte Cristo a romance novel. I've heard them call it an adventure novel. Yeah. So I realized at that point that I don't want to do that. I'm writing for me. And I hope that there are many other readers out there just like me. So I decided to self-publish because it wasn't that I didn't have faith in my work. It wasn't that I didn't don't think I could have gotten an agent. I've had short stories published and things like that. So as far as the accolades are concerned, I, I can get them. I'm, I'm comfortable that I can. I don't want to. I want to write a novel that I want to write. And I don't want to write a novel that is so easily pigeonholed into a genre. And everything that I saw was is that you would be forced to take your novel and turn it into a Lee Child novel. And again, I love Lee Child, except after you've read three Life Lee Child books, you've kind of read them all. You know, uh, and that's what I didn't want to have happen. So I'm lucky, I have a full-time job, I don't have to do that. And so that's why I chose to do it. Now, having said that, marketing the book is not impossible. got some parts in it that make me think, oh my god, I don't even know my brother. You know, <laughs> like, so did, was we nervous at all when you wrote it that there would be a reaction in the community that might Well, me? Uh, I would say that when, when Fran first read the book, there was sort of a get away from me. I just told get away. Get away. So when your wife sorts of sort of looks at you like get away from me, you scare me. Probably a little nervous. That's why he um, vacuums. Yeah. Uh, I, I will say that um, when my mother read the book and called me, and she was probably about a third of the way through the book, maybe, maybe a little bit more.
morning. And she said to me, I, I, I love you, but I don't think you should publish this. <laughs> right, Mom? We're still there. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, somebody, somebody asked me once, are, are you proud? Are, you know, are you excited that you publish your novel? I said, no. It's really, really, really a horrible, horrible feeling. Because it's like you're standing naked in front of a million people asking for their judgment. You're like, here's my soul. Anybody want to judge it? Here you go. All of those little dark places that everybody keeps hidden, I'm just like laying it right out there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, I try to explain to people that, you know, the outhouse is, is sort of appropriate for, you know, kind of an upper middle school child to be on. An Absence of Faith is a scarier book. Um, it's a more adult book. You know, it has some sexual situations and things like that, so definitely more of an adult book. Um, but I guess true to me, and I would say my students pretty much know me, right? I don't hide anything, you know what I mean? Like, I, I'm not the type of guy that like stands up in front of them and pretends I know everything. You know, um, if I don't know it, I'll tell them, and we'll you know figure it out together. Uh, so they're they're pretty much I think they know who I am. We're all good. <laughs> <laughs>